thank you very much everyone uh for coming um i am uh susan and i would like to introduce uh the poem with a couple of excerpts from um from other texts by coldridge right including the preface uh and an excerpt i've chosen from biographia literaria so without much further ado i i, I will start is that okay susan so okay welcome um, the slender volume heralded by Christabel that Byron got John Murray to publish in May 1816 drew a lot of ridicule for this Gothic romance. Byron pushed back. I won't have you sneer at Christabel. It is a fine, wild poem, he said to Murray, and said so again in a note to the Siege of Corinth, a wild and singularly original and beautiful poem and again to Thomas More, December 1816, after a savaging in the Edinburgh Review. Wild and sometimes unbeautiful, Murray balked at these two lines, behold her bosom and half her side, and then this is what Murray couldn't stomach, are lean and old and foul of hue. <laughs> in the publication, the line ends at, behold her bosom and half her side. That was enough. Um, this was followed by a long dash, leaving the line unrhymed, in this stanza anyway, but with a double recovery at the top of the next. She took two paces and a stride and lay down by the maiden's side, dash, exclamation point. Two paces and a stride. This bids fair as a metametrical staging of the principle Coleridge stated in his preface, counting in each line the accents, not the syllables, in correspondence with some transition in the nature of the imagery or passion. That's the closing line. Here's the preface that produces it. The first part of the following poem was written in the year 1797 at Stowey in the county of Somerset. The second part after my return from Germany in the year 1800 at Keswick, Cumberland. It is probable that if the poem had been finished at either of the former periods, or if even the first and second part had been published in the year 1800, the impression of its originality would have been much greater than I dare at present expect. But for this, I have only my own indolence to blame. The dates are mentioned for the exclusive purpose of precluding charges of plagiarism or servile imitation from myself. For there is amongst us a set of critics who seem to hold that every possible thought and image is traditional, who have no notion that there are such things as fountains in the world, small as well as great, and it would therefore charitably derive every reel they behold flowing from a perforation made in some other man's tank. I am confident, however, that this, as far as the present poem is concerned, the celebrated poets whose writings I might be suspected of having imitated, either in particular passages or in the tone and spirit of the whole, would be among the first to vindicate me from the charge and who, on any striking coincidence, would permit me to address them in this doggerel version of two monkish Latin hexameters. Yes, mine, and it is likewise yours, but and if this will not do, let it be mine, my good friend, for I am the poorer of the two. I have only to add that the meter of the Christabel is not, properly speaking, irregular, though it may seem so from its being founded on a new principle, namely that of counting in each line the accents, not the syllables. Though the latter may vary from seven to 12, yet in each line the accents will be found to be only four. Nevertheless, this occasional variation in number of syllables is not introduced wantonly or for the mere ends of convenience, but in correspondence with some transition in the nature of the imagery or passion. Part one, Piper, you're on. Tis the middle of night by the castle clock and the owls have awakened the crowing cock. To wit, to woo, 
And hark again, the crowing cock, how drowsily it crew. Sir Leoline, the barren rich, hath toothless mastiff bitch. From her kennel beneath the rock, she maketh answer to the clock. Four for the quarters, and twelve for the hour, ever an eye by shine and shower. Sixteen short howls, not over loud. Some say she sees my lady's shroud. Is the night chilly and dark? The night is chilly, but not dark. The thin gray cloud is spread on high. It covers, but not hides the sky. The moon is behind and at the full, and yet she looks both small and dull. The night is chill, the cloud is gray. Tis a month before the month of May, and the spring comes slowly up this way. The lovely lady, Christabel, whom her father loves so well, what makes her in the woods so late, a furlong from the castle gate? She had dreams all yesternight of her own betrothed knight, and she in the midnight wood will pray for the wheel of her lover that's far away. She stole along, she nothing spoke. She saw the sighs she heaved were soft and low, and naught was green upon the oak but moss and rarest mistletoe. She kneels beneath the huge oak tree, and in silence prayeth she. The lady sprang up suddenly, the lovely lady Christabel. It moaned as near as near can be, but what it is she cannot tell. On the other side, it seems to be of the huge, broad-breasted old oak tree. The night is chill, the forest bare. Is it the wind that moaneth bleak? There is not wind enough in the air to move away the ringlet curl from the lovely lady's cheek. There is not wind enough to twirl the one red leaf, the last of its clan, that dances as often as dance it can, hanging on so light and hanging so high on the topmost twig that looks up at the sky. Hush beating heart of Christabel, Jesu Maria, shield her well. She folded her arms beneath her cloak and stole to the other side of the oak. What sees she there? There she sees a damsel bright dressed in a silken robe of white that shadowy in the moonlight shone, the neck that made that white robe wan. Her stately neck and arms were bare, her blue-veined feet unsandaled wear, and wildly glittered here and there the gems entangled in her hair. I guess was, was frightful there to see a lady so richly clad as she, beautiful exceedingly. Mary mother, save me now, said Christabel. And who art thou? The lady strange made answer meet, and her voice was faint and sweet. Of pity on my sore distress, I scarce can speak for weariness. Stretch forth thy hand and have no fear, said Christabel. How camest thou here? And the lady, whose voice was faint, and sweet, did thus pursue her answer meet. My sire is of a noble line, and my name is Geraldine. Five warriors seized me yestermorn, me, even me, a maid forlorn. They choked my cries with force and fright, and tied me on a palfrey white. The palfrey was as fleet as wind, and they rode furiously behind. They spurred amain, their steeds were white. And once we crossed the shade of night. As sure as heaven shall rescue me, I have no thought what men they be, nor do I know how long it is, for I have lain entranced I with since one, the tallest of the five, took me from the palfrey's back, a weary woman scarce alive. Some muttered words his comrade spoke, he placed me underneath this oak. He swore they would return with haste, whither they went I cannot tell. I thought I heard some minutes past, sounds as of a castle bell. Stretch forth thy hand, 
thus ended she, and help to wretched maid to flee. Then Christabel stretched forth her hand and comforted fair Geraldine. Oh, well, bright damsel, may you command, bright dame, may you command the service of Sir Leoline, and gladly our stout chivalry will he stand forth, and friends with all, to guide and guard you safe and free home to your noble father's hall. She rose, and forth with steps they passed that strove to be and were not fast, her gracious stars the lady's breast, and thus spake on sweet Christabel. All our household are at rest, the hall as silent as the cell. Sir Leoline is weak in health and may not well awakened be, but we will move as if in stealth, and I beseech your courtesy this night to share your couch with me. They crossed the moat, and Christabel took the key that fitted well. The little door she opened straight, all in the middle of the gate. The gate that was iron within and without, where an army in battle array had marched out. The lady sank the light through pain, and Christabel, with might and main, lifted her up a weary weight over the threshold of the gate. Then the lady rose again and moved as she were not in pain. So free from danger, free from fear, they crossed the court, right glad they were. And Christabel devoutly cried to the lady by her side, praise we the Virgin all divine who hath rescued thee from thy distress. Alas, alas, said Geraldine, I cannot speak for weariness. So free from danger, free from fear, they crossed the court, right glad they were. Outside the kennel, the mastiff old lay fast asleep in moonshine cold. The mastiff old did not awake, yet she an angry moan did make. And what can ail the mastiff bitch? Never till now she uttered yell beneath the eye of Christabel. Perhaps it is the owlish scritch, for what can ail the mastiff bitch? They pass the hall that echoes still, pass as lightly as you will. The brands were flat, the brands were dying, amid their own white ashes lying. But when the lady passed, there came a tongue of light, a fit of flame, and Christabel saw the lady's eye, and nothing else she saw thereby. Save the boss of the shield of Sir Lillian tall, which hung in a murky old niche in the wall. Oh, softly tread, said Christabel, my father seldom sleepeth well. Sweet Christabel, her feet doth bare, and, jealous of the listening air, they steal their way from stair to stair, now in glimmer and now in gloom, and now they pass the baron's room, as still as death with stifled breath. And now have reached her chamber door, and now doth Geraldine press down the rushes of the chamber floor. The moon shines dim in the open air, and not a moonbeam enters here. But they without its light can see the chamber carved so curiously, carved with figures strange and sweet, all made out of the carver's brain for a lady's chamber meet. The lamp with two full silver chain is fastened to an angel's feet. The silver lamp burns dead and dim, but Christabel, the lamp will trim. She trimmed the lamp and made it bright and left it swinging to and fro, while Geraldine in wretched plight sank down upon the floor below. Oh, weary lady, Geraldine, I pray you drink this cordial wine. It is a wine of virtuous powers. My mother made it of wildflowers. And will your mother pity me, who am a maiden most forlorn? Christabel answered, woe is me. She died the hour that I was born. I have heard the gray-haired friar tell how on her deathbed she did say that she should hear the castle bell strike twelve upon my wedding day. Oh, mother dear, that thou wert here. I would, said Geraldine, she were. But soon with altered voice said she, Off, wandering mother, peak and pine, I have power to bid thee flee. Alas, what ails poor Geraldine? 
Why stares she with unsettled eye? Can she the bodiless dead espy? And why with hollow voice cries she, Off, woman, off! This hour is mine, though thou her guardian spirit be. Off, woman, off! Tis given to me. Then Christabel knelt by the lady's side, and raised to heaven her eyes so blue. Alas, said she, this ghastly ride, dear lady, it hath wildered you. The lady wiped her moist cold brow and faintly said, tis over now. Again the wild flower wine she drank. Her fair, large eyes gan glitter bright, and from the floor whereon she sank, the lofty lady stood upright. She was most beautiful to see, like a lady of a far country. And thus the lofty lady spake, All they who live in the upper sky do love you, holy Christabel, and you love them. And for their sake, and for the good which me befell, even I in my degree will try, fair maiden, to requite you well. But now unrobe yourself, for I must pray, ere yet in bed I lie. Quoth Christabel, so let it be. And as the lady bade, did she, her gentle limbs she did undress, and lay down in her loveliness. But through her brain of weal and woe, so many thoughts moved to and fro, that vain it were her lids to close. So halfway from the bed she rose, and on her elbow did recline to look at the lady Geraldine. Beneath the lamp the lady bowed and slowly rolled her eyes around. Then drawing in her breath aloud, like one that shuddered, she unbound the cincture from beneath her breast. Her silken robe and inner vest dropped to her feet and full in view. Behold, her bosom and half her side, a sight to dream of, not to tell. Oh, shield her, shield sweet Christabel. Yet Geraldine nor speaks nor stirs. Ah, what a stricken look she was hers. Deep from within she seems that way to live some weight with secrecy. An eyes the maiden seeks delay. Then suddenly, as one defied, collects herself in scorn and pride and lay down by the maiden's side. And in her arms the maid she took. Oh, well a day. And with low voice and doleful look, these words did say. In the touch of this bosom there worketh the spell, which is Lord of thy utterance, Christabel. Thou knowest tonight and wilt know tomorrow this mark of my shame, this seal of my sorrow. But vainly thou warst, for this is alone in thy power to declare that in the dim forest thou heardst a low moaning and foundst a bright lady surpassingly fair. And didst bring her home with thee in love and in charity to shield her and shelter her from the damp air. It was a lovely sight to see the Lady Christabel when she was praying at the old oak tree. Amid the jagged shadows of mossy leafless boughs, kneeling in the moonlight to make her gentle vows, her slender palms together pressed heaving sometimes on her breast, her face resigned to bliss or bale, her face, oh, call it fair, not pale, and both blue eyes more bright than clear, each about to have a tear. Is Nathan here? I guess I'm on. <laughs> okay. With open eyes, ah, oh, woe is me, asleep and dreaming fearfully, fearfully dreaming, yet I wis dreaming that alone, which is, oh, sorrow and shame. Can this be she, the lady who knelt at the old oak tree? And lo, the worker of these harms that holds the maiden in her arms seems to slumber still and mild as a mother with her child. A star hath set, a star hath risen. O oh, Geraldine, since arms of thine 
have been the lovely lady's prison. Oh, Geraldine, one hour was thine. Thou hast had thy will. By tern and rill, the night birds all that hour were still. But now they are jubilant anew from cliff and tower. To woo, to woo, to woo, to woo, from wood and fell. And see, the Lady Christabel gathers herself from out her trance. Her limbs relax, her countenance grows sad and soft. The smooth, thin lids close o'er her eyes, and tears she sheds. Large tears that leave the lashes bright, and oft the while she seems to smile as infants at a sudden light. Yea, she doth smile and she doth weep like a youthful hermitess, beauteous in a wilderness, who, praying always, prays in sleep. And if she move unquietly, perchance tis but the blood so free comes back and tingles in her feet. No doubt she hath a vision sweet. What if her guardian spirit were? What if she knew her mother near? But this she knows, in joys and woes, the saints will aid if men will call, for the blue sky bends over all. Each matin bell, the barren Seth, knells us back to a world of death. These words Sir Leoline first said when he rose and found his lady dead. These words Sir Leoline will say many a morn to his dying day. And hence the custom and law began that still at dawn, the sacristan who duly pulls the heavy bell, five and 40 beads must tell between each stroke, a warning knell, which not a soul can choose but hear from breath ahead to Windermere. Seth Bracy the, the, the bard, so let it knell and let the drowsy sacristan still count as slowly as he can. There is no lack of such, I ween, as well fill up the space between and Langdale Pike and Witch's Lair and Dungeon Gill so foully rent with ropes of rock and bells of air, three sinful sextons ghosts are pent who all give back one after the other, the death note to their living brother. And off too by the knell offended, just as their one, two, three is ended. The devil mocks the doleful tale with a merry peal from Borodath. The air is still through mist and cloud. That merry peal comes ringing loud, and Geraldine shakes off her dread and rises lightly from the bed. Puts on her silken vestments white and tricks her hair in lovely plight, and nothing doubting of her spell awakens the Lady Christabel. Sleep you, sweet Lady Christabel? I trust that you have rested well. And Christabel awoke and spied the same who lay down by her side, or rather say the same whom she raised up beneath the old oak tree. Nay, fairer yet, and yet more fair, for she belike hath drunken deep of all the blessedness of sleep. And while she spake, her looks, her air, such gentle thankfulness declare, that, so it seemed, her girded vests grew tight beneath her heaving breasts. Sure I have sinned, said Christabel. Now heaven be praised if all be well. And in low faltering tones, yet sweet, did she the lofty lady greet with such perplexity of mind as dreams too lively leave behind. So quickly she rose and quickly arrayed her maiden limbs, and having prayed that he who on the cross did groan might wash away her sins unknown, she forthwith led fair Geraldine to meet her sire, Sir Leoline. The lovely maid and the lady tall are pacing both into the hall, 
and pacing on through page and groom, enter the Baron's presence room. The Baron rose, and while he pressed his gentle daughter to his breast, with cheerful wonder in his eyes, the Lady Geraldine espies, and gave such welcome to the same, as might beseem so bright a dame. But when he heard the lady's tale, and when she told her father's name, why waxed Sir Leoline so pale, murmuring o'er the name again, Lord Roland de Vaux of Triamain? Alas, they had been friends in youth, but whispering tongues can poison truth, and constancy lives in realms above, and life is thorny, and youth is vain. And to be wroth with one we love doth work like madness in the brain. And thus it chanced, as I divine, with Roland and Sir Leoline, each spake words of high disdain and insult to his heart's best brother. They parted ne'er to meet again, but never either found another to free the hollow heart from paining. They stood aloof, the scars remaining, like cliffs which had been rent asunder. A dreary sea now flows between, but neither heat nor frost nor thunder shall wholly do away, I ween, the marks of that which once hath been. Sir Leoline, a moment's space, stood gazing on the damsel's face, and the youthful lord of Triermain came back upon his heart again. Oh, then the baron forgot his age, his noble heart swelled high with rage. He swore by the wounds in Jesus' side, he would proclaim it far and wide with trump and solemn heraldry, that they who thus had wronged the dame were base and spotted infamy. And if they dare deny the same, my herald shall appoint a week and let the recreant traitors seek my attorney court, that there and then I may dislodge their reptile souls from the bodies and forms of men. He spake, his eye in lightning rolls, for the lady was ruthlessly seized, and he can and the beautiful lady, the child of his friend. And now the tears were on his face, and fondly in his arms he took fair Geraldine, who met the embrace, prolonging it with joyous look, which when she viewed a vision fell upon the soul of Christabel, the vision of fear, the touch and pain, she shrunk and shuddered and saw again. Ah, woe is me, was it for thee, thou gentle maid, such sights to see? Again she saw that bosom old, again she felt that bosom cold, and drew in her breath with a hissing sound, whereat the knight turned wildly round, and nothing saw but his own sweet maid, with eyes upraised as one who prayed. The touch, the sight had passed away, and in its stead that vision blessed, which comforted her after rest, while in the lady's arms she lay, had put a rapture in her breast, and on her lips and o'er her eyes spread smiles like light. With naive surprise, what ails then my beloved child, the baron said. His daughter mild made answer, all will yet be well. I ween she had no power to tell all tells. So mighty was the spell. Yet he who saw this Geraldine had deemed her sure a thing divine. Such sorrow with such grace she blended as if she feared she had offended sweet Christabel, that gentle maid. And with such lowly tones she prayed, she might be sent without delay home to her father's mansion. Nay, nay, by my soul, said Leoline. Ho, Bracy the bard, the charge be thine. Go thou with music sweet and loud, and take two steeds with trappings proud, and take the youth whom thou lovest best to bear thy harp, and learn thy song, and clothe you both in solemn vest, and o'er the mountains haste along, lest wandering folk that are abroad detain you on the valley road. When he has crossed the earthing flood, my merry bard, he hastes, he hastes up Narren Moor through Halegarth Wood, and reaches soon that castle good, which stands and threatens Scotland's wastes. Bard Bracy, Bard Bracy, your horses are fleet. He must ride up the hall, your music so sweet, more loud than your horse's echoing feet and loud and loud to Lord Roland call. Thy daughter is safe in Langdale Hall. Thy beautiful daughter is safe and free. 
Sir Leoline greets thee thus through me. He bids thee come without delay with all thy numerous array and take thy lovely daughter home with all his numerous array. White with their panting palfreys foam and by mine honor, I will say that I repent me of the day when I spake words of fierce disdain to Roland de Vau of prayer man. For since that evil hour hath flown, many a summer's sun hath shone, yet ne'er found I a friend again like Roland de Vau of prayer man. The lady fell and clasped his knees, her face upraised, her eyes o'erflowing. And Gracie replied with faltering voice, his gracious hail on all bestowing. By words, thou sire of Christabel, are sweeter than my heart can tell. Yet might I gain a boon of thee this day, my journey should not be. So, so strange a dream hath come to me that I have bowed with music loud to clear yon wood from thing unblessed, born by a vision in my rest. For in my sleep I saw that dove, the gentle bird whom thou dost love and pulse by thy own daughter's name. Sir Leoline, I saw the same, fluttering and uttering fearful moan among the green herbs in the forest alone which when I saw and when I heard, I wondered what might ail the bird, for nothing near it could I see, save the grass and green herbs underneath the old tree. And in my dream, methought I went to search out what might there be found, and what the sweet bird's trouble meant that thus lay fluttering on the ground. I went and peered, and could descry no cause for her distressful cry. But yet, for her dear lady's sake, I stooped, methought, the dove to take, when lo, I saw a bright green snake coiled around its wings and neck, green as the herbs on which it couched. Close by the dove's, its head it crouched. And with the dove it heaves and stirs, swelling its neck as she swelled hers. I woke, it was the midnight hour, the clock was echoing in the tower, but though my slumber was gone by, the stream, it would not pass away. It seems to live up in my eye, and there I found the self same day with music strong and scented song to wander through the forest bare, last old a holy loiter there. Thus, Brassy said, the baron the while, half listening, heard him with a smile. Then turned to Lady Geraldine, his eyes met up wonder and love, and said in courtly accents, Fine. Sweet maid, Lord Roland's beauteous dove, with arms more strong than harp or song, thy sire and I will crush the snake. He kissed her forehead as he spake. And Geraldine in maiden wise cast down her large bright eyes. With blushing cheek and courtesy fine, she turned her from Sir Leoline, softly gathering up her train that o'er her right arm fell again, and folded her arms across her chest, and couched her head upon her breast. And looked askance at Christabel, Jesu Maria, shield her well. A snake's small eye blinks dull and shy, and the lady's eyes, they shrunk in her head, each shrunk up to a serpent's eye, and with somewhat of a malice and more of dread, at Christabel she looked askance, one moment, and the sight was fled. But Christabel in dizzy trance, stumbling on the unsteady ground, shuddered aloud with a hissing sound, and Geraldine again turned round, and like a thing that sought relief, Full of wonder and full of grief, she rolled her large bright eyes divine wildly on Sir Leoline. Maid, alas, her thoughts are gone. She nothing sees 
no sight but one. The maid, devoid of guile and sin, I know not how, in fearful wise, so deeply had she drunken in that look, those shrunken serpent eyes, that all her features were resigned to this sole image in her mind, and passively did imitate that look of dull and treacherous hate. And thus she stood in dizzy trance, still picturing that look askance with forced unconscious sympathy, full before her father's view, as far as such a look could be in eyes so innocent and blue. And when the trance was o'er, the maid paused a while and inly prayed, then falling at the baron's feet, by my mother's soul do I entreat that thou this woman send away, she said, and no more she could not say. For what she knew she could not tell, or mastered by the mighty spell. Why is thy cheek so wan and wild, Sir Leoline? Thy only child lies at thy feet, thy joy, thy pride, so fair, so innocent, so mild, the same for whom thy lady died, and calls by thy own daughter's name, Sir Leoline, I saw the same fluttering and uttering fearful moan among the green herbs in the forest alone, which when I saw and when I heard, I wondered what might ail the bird, for nothing near it could I see, save the grass and green herbs underneath the old tree. Oh, I read the wrong. By the pangs of her dead mother, Think thou no evil of thy child, for her and thee, and for no other. She prayed the moment as she died, prayed that the babe for whom she died might prove her that those joys and pride. That prayer, her deadly pines beguile, still a line. And was thou wrong, thy only child, her child and thine, within the baron's heart and brain, if thoughts like these have any share, they only swell his rage and pain, and did but work confusion there. His heart was cleft with pain and rage, his cheeks they quivered, his eyes were wild. Dishonoured thus in his old age, dishonoured by his only child, and all his hospitality to the wronged daughter of his friend, by more than woman's jealousy, brought thus to a disgraceful end. He rolled his eye with stern regard upon the gentle minstrel bard, and said in tones abrupt, austere. Why, Bracy, dost thou loiter here? I bade thee hence. The bard obeyed, and turning from his own sweet maid, the aged knight, Sir Leoline, led forth the lady Geraldine. A little child, a limber elf, singing, dancing to itself, a fairy thing with red round cheeks, that always finds and never seeks, makes such a vision to the sight as fills a father's eyes with light. And pleasures flow in so thick and fast upon his heart that he at last must needs express his love's excess with words of unmeant bitterness. Perhaps tis pretty to force together thoughts so all unlike each other, to mutter and mock a broken charm to dally with wrong that does no harm. Perhaps tis tender too and pretty at each wild word to feel within a sweet recoil of love and pity. And what if in a world of sin, oh, sorrow and shame should this be true, such giddiness of heart and brain comes seldom save from rage and pain, so talks as it's most used to do. Thank you very much. That's great. I will set, I will close this with um, the following fragment from Biographia Literaria. So in chapter 14 of Biographia Literaria, published in 1817, Coleridge recounted how lyrical ballads and Christabel had been conceived 20 years earlier. This is a fiction, it seems. One critic even takes it as a token of Coleridge's autocracy when rewriting history. As had words for Spreefest, Coleridge presented as a focus plan 
a motley collection of poems written over a decade under different circumstances and for different purposes. Even so, his account is a memorable legend, not least for producing the phrase, now an international meme, willing suspensionist of disbelief. <clears throat> During the first year that Mr. Wordsworth the power of exciting the sympathy of the reader by a faithful adherence to the truth of nature, and the power of giving the interest of novelty by the modifying colors of imagination, the sudden charm which accidents of light and shade, which moonlight or sunset diffused over a known and familiar landscape, appear to represent the practicability of combining both. These are the poetry of nature. The thought suggested it Self, to which of us I do not recollect, that a series of poems might be composed of two sorts. In the one, the incidents and agents were to be, in part at least, supernatural, and the excellence aimed at was to consist in the interesting of the affections by a dramatic truth of such emotions as would naturally accompany such situations, supposing them real. And real in this sense they have been to every a human being who, from whatever source of delusion, has at any time believed himself under supernatural agency. For the second class, subjects were to be chosen from ordinary life. The characters and incidents were to be such as will, as will be found in every village in its vicinity where there is a meditative and feeling mind to seek after them or to notice them when they present themselves. In this idea originated the plan of the lyrical balance, in which it was agreed that my endeavors should be directed to persons and characters supernatural, or at least romantic, yet so as to transfer from our inward nature a human interest and a semblance of truth sufficient to procure for these shadows of imagination that willing suspension of disbelief for the moment which constitutes poetic faith. Mr. Wordsworth, on the other hand, was to propose himself as his op Object, to give the charm of novelty to things of every day and to excite a feeling analogous to the supernatural by awakening the mind's attention from the lethargy of custom and directing it to the loveliness and the wonders of the world before us, an inexhaustible treasure, but for which in consequence of the film of familiarity and selfish solicitude, we have eyes yet see not, ears that hear not, and hearts that neither feel nor understand. With this view, I wrote The Ancient Mariner and was preparing, among other poems, The Dark Lady and the Christabel, in which I should have more nearly realized my ideal than I had done in my first attempt. But Mr. Wordsworth's industry had proved so much more successful and the number of his poems so much greater that my compositions, instead of forming a balance, appear rather an interpolation of a genius matter. Mr. Wordsworth added two or three poems written in his own character, in the impassioned, lofty, and sustained diction which is characteristic of his genius. In this form, the lyrical ballads were published and were presented by him as an experiment, whether subjects, which from their nature rejected the usual ornaments and extra colloquial style of poems in general, might not be so managed in the language of ordinary life as to produce the pleasurable interest which is which it is the peculiar business of poetry to impart that's it um i hope you found that interesting uh if you hadn't read that before uh, and maybe we could discuss this passage or or anything about the ballad really uh in the few minutes or uh, the minutes we have left can you hear me properly because my connection is very unstable well, I'll ask just an obvious question. Um, how did this poem um, affect your sense of the poetry and hearing it read out loud? My students always say that's a kind of radical shift in perception for them, is to hear the words rather than see them on the page. Hmm. Mark? 
That's such a great question. Yeah, I, and I would love to hear what other people think about that. Um, and I was so struck as people were doing their amazing readings and thanks to everyone for bringing so much passion and creativity into it. I was so struck by the different approaches that people have to the drama of the poem and the degree to which this is a poem that's narrated versus a poem that um, endows uh, certain speakers with um, a very kind of characteristic way of speaking. Um, and I was wondering if other people had thoughts about that um, um, because I, I'm just so fascinated by the narrator of the poem and how the narr narrator kind of takes over everything. But it is a poem that's filled with kind of luscious dramatic voices. So um, those were just like a couple of thoughts that I had from listening to what other people were um, narrating. I um, also noticed the same and uh, um, the variation, but really interesting how the, the rhythm, um, which obviously, you know, Coleridge um, wrote about um, in the intro, and, and also, you know, the, the modulations of sound, the tone where you pause, which is so important because so many of the words um, can be taken and obviously we pick up on that, but really you hear it in sound before, before your eye, I think, sees it on the page. We're used to doing it formally on the page, but you, you know, when you voice it, you have to make a choice in terms of where, where you're gonna pause or, or what tone of voice you're gonna use, whether something's ironic or whatever. So all of that came out in such varied ways, some of which I thought, oh yeah, that's what I always thought. And then other ones I thought, oh, wait a minute. So I really love that. Mark and Judith, thanks, thanks for that. I completely agree with you. Um, can you see me? I don't know if you can or not, but yeah, good. Um, uh, I always get students to read um, this poem and others aloud in class, and it really, really makes a difference. They hear the poem, they hear the sounds, they, they hear the rhythms that Susan was talking about earlier. But I thought this was fantastic this evening, and, and it really was good to hear, hear how the different voices brought out the poem. So, yeah, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Pablo and Susan for organizing this. It's just been a really, really good experience and it's lovely to see everyone. Well, I'll say one more thing just quickly. Um, thank you everyone, but I wanted to hear from Karen Swan who's written about the um, hysterical or hystericized narrator and also unrelatedly or maybe relatedly, I was much more impressed by the plot of rhymes in hearing all the rhymes for Christabel and their modular shifts, um, as well as the rhyme we're all waiting for, um, Geraldine to form a couplet with Sir Leoline, but through um, you know, a rather um, torturous and different web of divine and all sorts of other things. So I think this is a poem um, as much about its rhyme plots as about its metrical pulse. In, in Coleridge's words, but I want to ask Karen if she has some um, decades on thoughts about her, her wonderful work on the narrator. Is Karen still here? <laughs> I'm here. I'm, uh, I'm, can you hear me? I have, I have bad is. internet, but, um, but I don't know that I don't have any more thoughts. <laughs> I haven't thought about the poem for, I mean, in that way for a long time, but I do, I do love the narrator. I mean, I do think the narrator um, forgets that it or they or, or I, who knows who the narrator is or if there are more than one of them. Or, but I, I love the way they um, and and I was really hearing it in the reading too that the way the narrator forgets that narrators are supposed to know the end of the plot and get caught up and and um, uh, start to um, call on someone to shield sweet Christabel or, you know, you know that, that, that it's a story they're supposedly managing, but they're also losing control of it all the time. And often at those wonderful 
scary moments or gothic moments when when they're um yeah it's as though it's as though that it's not their story anymore they're they're losing it but i don't have i don't think i have any more to say than i had to say 20 years ago really <laughs> but but I, I was really enjoying hearing people figure out how to how to deal with them which which i think is a really interesting or it or the the narrator or the narrators um, i think you just said something spectacularly important which is that the narrators may be a plural that this may be um a choral or communal story that is being passed around from narrator to narrator yeah you've, you've written about that wonderfully about martha ray and I just think your um, slightly apologetic or sideways plural here is really is really suggestive, and of course perfect for our occasion. We well, well, it's suggestive, I think, also for the fact that there's the pairings of Christabel and Geraldine, who may or may not be, you know, there, there's speculation about what's their relation to each other. There's the pairing of Leoline and and um, the Baron, and so so there's I think there's there's a sense of the fracturing of of supposedly. Um, uh, integral characters that, that is happening all the time. And I, I like the way the narrators or the narrator or the narrators start to kind of, uh, you know, I mean, they'll take different tones and um, uh, they, they can feel like they're in different genres or it can feel like it's in different genres. Another thing that's always struck me is the way in which the, uh, the narrator's interjections impede the narrative rather than moving it forward. We, we have to wait for the narrator to get over uh, their shock at or their their quest to express their questions about what's on the other side of the tree and and the appeals to Yezu, Maria and so on and and the the ways in which the narrator becomes kind of an obstacle to uh, to the temporal movement. I I do have something that I must add here since Karen is here with us that um, I can't read this poem without thinking of Karen Swan as the ultimate narrator of it because I first was exposed to it as an undergrad in Karen Swan's class. So I have her to thank for just having this like gorgeous voice reading this poem in my head all the time. It's just so wonderful. Um, but I also was thinking as I finished Daisy Hayes' biography of Joseph Johnson, and I couldn't help when I was reading this poem of thinking about um, the issue of casuistry and people talking about what they do know and what they don't know in the environment of the 1790s. And although this like slightly postdates the moment of, you know, the extreme heat that Daisy Hay is talking about, you know, this is still uh, a kind of a moment of the clamp down in, um, in speech and writing. And so like this, like, what does the narrator know? What does the narrator not know? What's, what is being hedged about? Um, I just, it, it may have no relation to the poem, but I couldn't help thinking about it um, in my like post um, Daisy Hay moment. Yeah. I think that's very relevant, you know, the power right at the beginning, the power to declare and, and the way in which that that's an issue right through in the characters as well as the narrator and so much of what's going on in, and how we take it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are we done? Maybe just one final observation uh, on my side related to what um, was just said by Mark. Uh, you mentioned casuistry, right? And that's like, I think so far as I understand, like mostly a Jesuit discipline. Uh, and all these explanations are strongly, uh, I'd say, Latinized and could be related perhaps to 
more Catholic traditions? Am I mistaken? What, what do you, what's your take on that? Well, it's a question for Mark or anyone else that might know something about that. Um, this, this does seem to be set in um, Catholic uh, England, um, even if it's under a Protestant domain. Uh, this is a Catholic quarter. Um, but I, I don't know, that's my sense of it anyway, is that it's retro in the way that Keats' is Eve of St. Agnes is. But, you know, retro, of course, is always double parked, right? And it's modern moment and it's retro idiom. Mm -hmm. Like Gothic fiction, well, in general, yeah. no? Like Castle that's of it. Otranto or France, Spain, whatever, yeah. I'm curious about the range of the ways in which our students have responded to the poem. Um, do they? Do you find your students um, as mesmerized by it as we are? Do they have those big questions about what's going on underneath the her cloak? Uh, I think uh, some of my students were. Uh, bewitched as much as I was because uh, two of my students were here listening uh, all through the po poem reading. I think when I read um, them out loud, they are uh, intrigued by the rhythm of the poem and the rhymes and the meter because uh, Coleridge's uh, prowess in writing these uh, poems is incredible. He speaks to us through centuries, even from uh, back his day. I think we are still having conversations with him and we listen to him uh, rising on the wings of poesy, if I may mm -hmm. say. If I can jump in, uh, my students love this too, uh, but they sometimes find it a bit confusing, especially the ending. And I would love to hear what you all think of the sort of the, the way that the poem more it stops rather than ends and we're left to sort of imaginatively you know fill in the ending um i often when i teach this i'll pair it with um kubla khan and talk about fragments as a genre so i'd love to and i was thinking can we talk about then you know what happens to the narrator or narrator is to you know <laughs> that this story never really ends um well that pairing as you know is some um... You know, in the original volume, it was, you know, Christabel, Kubla Khan, and the Pains of Sleep. Um, one assignment that my students have really loved working with is what's going on with the dream when you have two radically different interpretations. And this unfolds, obviously, into a question about interpretation in general in the poem from not only that spectacular scene of the dream narrative, um, but just in very small details of the poem about how um, the poem puts you in kind of interpretive overdrive and then tricks you um, for your too readiness to leap on any detail and, you know, and, and milk big significance out of it. Um, another very local moment is when Geraldine um, and Christabel go, go across the fireplace and the flames leap up. Um, they are so gothicized by that point that the obvious explanation, which my science students always provide, is this is a draft. Um, that has, you know, woken up the embers. There's nothing supernatural going on there, but there is in terms of a mind that is already supernaturalized in a way that Coleridge's description of the process um, in that wonderful narrative of biographia, whether it's true or false, um, ha has a way of, um, you know, really illuminating. So that's a good assignment for your students is to, to take their confusions about what's going on and have them um, you know, lightly theorize that as an important effect and part of the supernatural idiom. Uh, when I told the story of the poem to my wife, uh, she came up with an interesting uh, sequel to this um, to this. Uh, poem. As she said, Geraldine might not be who she is. Uh, she's taken over by an evil spirit. And then when she comes here, 
she's going to take over Christabel's body because uh, Geraldine, in having her invite her to the house is a way of her inviting Geraldine to her body, the, not just the house, but the body as well. So it was an interesting read on her uh, because it was the first time she heard it, but she's a horror a horror fiction maniac. So I think she's used to it. <laughs> I, I think it'd be wonderful to ask students to write what happens next and see uh, how differently they, they interpret the very signs in the poem. Yeah, you get many different perspectives. Uh, apropos our discussion of uh, many narrators and many perspectives, I think the students would come up with contradictory interpretations, which is, uh, I guess, the goal. And like you're saying, Susan, um, that's very Coleridgean. That's what Jerry McGann first said about Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, that it, we're all in overdriven interpretation mode. And that's one of the intentions. Uh, very, very Coleridgean. I really like the question about the the end of the poem, and I think part of why I requested to read that second to last stanza is because it it resonated for me in a way that was new. I'm a new father as of two and a half years ago, and 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 I just I took those lines completely in just a new way, and thinking about it in terms of the poem, I, I mean, I just I, I imagine Coleridge sort of like ending on this note, going back in time to a moment when Sir Leoline, you know, felt that way towards Christabel and, and there, thereby kind of indirectly, maybe even sort of like just thinking about the regrets he already had at this point in writing the poem about being a father and, and the wish to kind of correct or undo those. And it, I, you know, for me, it's, I like this ending more and more every time I read it because it it's doing this kind of jumping around in time that 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 Coleridge is is very deft at uh, in in his best moments. Well, um, as as we know, those that conclusion was imported um, from somewhere else. Uh, a letter that Coleridge, I believe, had written to Southey about being a father. And when I taught this poem in my graduate seminar, a, a new father with his fourth child said, I get it. I mean, it was your moment. He said, there are times when you really resent your children because everything seems to come so easily to them and, and torturous to you. Um, and that's, that's just a very odd sort of gloss on Sir Leoline and Christabel, who after all comes into the world at the cost of the death of her mother, a very frequent situation for children um, in, in the 1790s, not least Mary Shelley, um, or the later Mary Shelley. Um, so that's a real complex of pain and love that the end of the poem, I think, speaks to in ways that are sort of officially forbidden, but gothically enabled. Any other new parents want to come jump in? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not a parent, um, but I, mean, I, I just really like what everybody said about this idea. You know, it almost feels like a perverted version of, you know, colored sentiments in uh, Frost to Midnight, you know, in which when he's looking at his son and feel like, oh my God, you're going to have so much what I couldn't have before. Uh, and in this case, if we are just to, going to draw this by a further you know, stretch, maybe let's say, imagine Geraldine being like a representation representation of nature, whom, you know, Coleridge spent his life thinking about, I want to be a part of it, but always find there's something that's stopping him from doing it. And now like the daughter, you know, the, ch the child invites nature into the household of humanity and then everything just starts going wrong. So I can, I don't know where I'm going with this, but it also can feel like a somewhat can be a good idea for a scary story, you know, like a realization of his own nightmare. 
just just to jump off of that, Leon, um, maybe it's just because I was recently rewatching David Lynch's um, work. Um, but I'm, ass I'm assuming most of you have all seen Twin, Twin Peaks. So this time when I was reading the poem, the only thing I could think about was the owls because I hadn't really paid attention to the, you know, to the to wit to woos when I was reading this before. But this time now I'm now I'm interpreting this um, father daughter relationship through the lens of David Lynch, which now I'm going to just guess that he probably based most of Twin Peaks on uh, Coleridge. So as everyone should work from Coleridge. <laughs> but anyways, I just wanted to put that out there in case uh, you needed a, a, a creepy afternoon rewatch of uh, something that might be inspired by this slowly poem. <laughs> What's the quote from Twin Peaks? Isn't it the owls know more than it the, the owls are the owls are not what they sing. The owls are not what they yeah. sing. And, and then in, in the, the, the last season that they finally made 25 years later, um, the the line there um, is uh, who who is I think it's like who is the dreamer or whose dream is this, um, and so there's I mean, yeah. There's, there's a poem by Shelley as well, no? In, in Twin Peaks. Oh yes, yes, Shelley's in there, and then of course when one of the characters dies, there uh, it's because they were reading Lord Byron's love poems, you know. So he's uh, he's definitely a romanticist, Mr. Lynch. <laughs> Mm -hmm. there's lots of broken relationships no it's it's this father child thing that that closes and then sheds this new light on the whole poem but there's also this relationship between friends who have um fallen apart and then find an occasion to meet again perhaps through that loss no maybe the death of Christabel's mother, um, the loneliness, the pain that has uh, Sir Leonite like this. Um, yeah, I think that's also a very beautiful relationship, the way he wants to recover a friendship long lost through, through forms of masculinity that were perhaps in the romantic period already being questioned, no? this thing about pride and, and whatnot. Not to go too deep into the David Lynch wormhole, but it struck me in the new season of Twin Peaks that the the character, the actress performer who played Tammy, her stage name is Krista Bell with a Y. Like, and, and <clears throat> yeah, and she was like, you know, David Lynch's kind of favorite at the time of screen. I don't know much else about her. I know that she's a sort of artist of some sort, but um, I'm like, well, that's a great nom de plume. Um, I'm going back into uh, teaching this ne the next year after a spell as dean. So I've just been supervising postgrad students and um, giving some MA classes in the last three or four years. So this has been immensely helpful this evening to hear people's thoughts about how we can um, work with our students with poems, Christabel and, and other poems like it. Because I don't know how uh, things are in the US at the moment, but I think they're pretty much as they are here in terms of recruitment in the humanities and in literature in particular. We're having to think of ways that we can get students thinking differently about the poems that we're teaching to get them involved, get them immersed in what they're doing. Once they're hooked, they're hooked. But a lot of what we've been talking about here this evening is going to be immensely helpful to me. I always used um, readings in class and in seminars uh, and recitation, such as Adam was describing earlier. And the students always fed back really, really positively on that. When asked for their favourite, what, what did you like most about the module? They would almost always come up with the readings aloud of poems and um, the dramatisation of poems. So I think what's been said this evening has been really helpful. But I love the Twin Peaks um, connection. I hadn't really thought about that. So Kayla and Julian, really, thanks for that. I'm a big Twin Peaks fan. I think we have to be careful in um, aligning romantic poetry perhaps too much with, with that kind of work. But I can see why you went in that direction. Uh, I'm really convinced. Thank you.
Well, Pablo, do you want to sing us off? <laughs> Yeah, so I was writing uh, on the chat. If I'm not mistaken, Kyla, I think uh, Mark Fisher talks about David Lynch in the weed and the Yeti. Uh, I don't know if you read that uh, posthumous uh, work. I will. I will look into it, and after okay. and after the the International Byron Conference is done in August, then I'll I'll get on this article. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, from for attending, for reading, for listening, uh, and for, for staying and hanging out to to share just a few ideas right about this amazing poem that still so intriguing, so charming, so captivating two centuries after being written. Uh, and uh, I hope we keep this alive. Uh, I won't be able to organize the next meeting, but I really hope someone else takes over. And that we can read. Apparently, it's the the marriage of heaven and hell. No, so I'd be happy to to join in again and, and keep meeting. I don't know twice a year or however regularly uh, these ends up being. So thanks again, uh, Susan. Would you like to add a few words to that? Uh, sure. Um, it's not that hard to do, although there are a lot of moving parts. Uh, basically, you have to find a poem, the reading of which at human speed can happen um, around 45 minutes, um, get a text that everyone can share, divide it up into pieces in relation to those who step forward to volunteer. And then, you know, then it's a matter of advertising and confirming people's participation. John Bug is always ready to help out with um, the Zoom um, technologies. He couldn't this year because he's in an airplane somewhere, um, but uh, usually he's available. And I'm always available to um, advise on, you know, the mechanics of setting this up and to, to co-host as I'm able. So, okay, well, everybody en enjoy the rest of the summer. Think of um, Percy Shelley on um, on the anniversary of the Mask of Anarchy. And um, if you've got an idea for something that would work well, um, you know, as a group read um, within a reasonable time frame, um, you know, set it up and I'll, I'll help out as I can. Okay, bye everyone. Thank you again, Pablo. To you, thanks for your support all these months. Uh, without you, uh, I wouldn't have managed this. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you bye -bye. so much for everything.